Yeah, ready. So, dear friends, hello, 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 and welcome to Instagram. Today, our guest speaker is Oba Kasube. Oba was born in Lagos in 1962, and he is a graduate of Hull University in the UK. He is a QC and was called to the English Bar in 1985 and to the Nigerian Bar in 1986. When he took silk in the UK in 2002, on his first application, aged only 39, he became the first Nigerian practicing above to be promoted to Queen's Council and the second youngest in his year and the only black silk. By then, at the age of 35, he had already been appointed a part-time judge of the Crown Court, England and Wales, the youngest in the country at the time. In 2003, he was a member of Lord Justice's Glidewell Committee on Judicial Appointment and Silk, which recommended reaching changes to the system of appointments. Oba spent seven years as a member of the Judicial Studies Board, England and Wales, responsible for the training of judges and recorders. He has served on several committees of the General Council of the Bar, including professional discipline, education, and race relations. Oba was promoted to the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria in 2005 and elected a bencher of Grace Inn in the same year. In 2006, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, and for 10 years, he acted as a legal assessor for the General Medical Council, with lesser periods performing the same role for the Nursing and Midwifery Council and the General Pharmaceutical Council. But there's more. In 2010, he featured in the Power List as one of Britain's 100 most influential black people. For 15 years, he headed Pump Court Chambers in London, a large common law set of chambers, and the only black head of chambers in the temple. Oba is a visiting professor of law to City University and a senior, a senior fellow of the Nigerian Leadership Initiative. In 2014, Oba was appointed a member of the National Competitiveness Council of Nigeria. He is a founding member of the British Nigerian Law Forum and a founder member of Central Associations of Nigerian in the UK, Canuck. He recently is the recently elected chair of the Africa Center, a passionate lover of arts, a prior member of the Tate African Arts the particular interest in Africa. What curriculum? And thank you for agreeing to be my guest today. My pleasure, Nadia. My pleasure. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too, my friend. So, Oba, let's get started. You have broken many glass ceilings and many records throughout your career in law, and you're involved in a variety of associations and charities. What is your story? Well, my story is that I'm a very lucky man. Um, so I was born in Lagos, as you, as you said, in Lagos Island Maternity Hospital. And I think I must have been a handful from the beginning because I was quite a big baby. And all credit must go to my mum for, for getting me out. Um, I was well over eight pounds. And um, having arrived in this world, uh, all our relations were coming to the hospital, including one of my uncles, who was a police inspector. Um, but he was always drunk, even on duty. So he arrived at the hospital, stumbled in, sat down, saw me. Uh, my dad was there. Everybody was around. And he gave me the name Oba. And the name Oba in Nigeria, in a number of our ethnic tribes, means king. 
Um, it means king or chief. And he gave me that name by my sheer size. Um, and from then on, I kind of have lived with this heavy mantle, right? It's because when, when people say, well, what's your name? And I say, my name is um, Oba. And they say, Oba, what, Oba Femi, Oba. They start adding bits to it because they think it can't just be that. But that is just what it is. And um, so I blame my uncle. Um, he, 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 he instilled something in me which really um, took quite a long time to come out. Um, and, uh, and my parents particularly, we're, we're from, we're from Asaba. So that's on the river Niger, across the bridge from Onicha. Um, Asaba is a very, very old town, a kingdom, and, um, a, a real history of, uh, being on the edge of the Igbos. Um, we don't strictly see ourselves as Igbos, but we are Igbos. And, uh, a lot of ancestry, a lot of rich tradition. Um, and a strong emphasis on education, as, as so many of us Africans have. And so my father uh, was an academic. He's not with us anymore, but he was an academic. He was a teacher. And his profession, his vocation was sociology, um, the history of African man, and anthropology. So he studied at Edinburgh University, um, he then uh, did a doctorate at Oxford and then taught at Oxford for a while, spent some time at the British Museum. He was in the antiquities section, and there he was basically crying his eyes out, uh, looking at all the Benin bronzes. And this was years and years and years ago. He couldn't take it. He left it yet. Um, but he had a real passion for Africa. And even then, we, I remember being in the boot of the car. We went, he was in the boot of the car. We went across the border into Benin very, very early in my life. My dad was in the boot. And my dad was in the boot because he was an activist. And that was just before war broke out in Nigeria. And we went down to Zambia, um, where a lot of Igbos collected. And my early memories of my father raising money for food, for families, for refugees, and activism. He was a short man, but he would stand, he would stand on a little pedestal with his dark glasses, and he would give these amazing speeches. And the rallies, there would be thousands of people. My father would just talk about nationhood and the importance of unity and the importance of fairness and sharing resource, you know? And, and even then, I mean, I was... A, a small kid growing up in Lusaka, but it, something must have permeated. So that's really what makes me tick. I owe so much to my parents. You know, Nadia, what happens, I think, is your parents plant, they plant implants in you, mm -hmm. okay? So these things, they live in you. They're almost like these alien bodies that live in you. And you never know when they wake up and activate you as a person. I suspect they activate boys or men later than the girls, but they activate you. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty hopeless in my teens. I was like, I used to part. I was just, I just was aimless, right? And just had no real sense of direction. I just, I was just not really focused. And my father used to say to me, ah, you useless boy, when, when are you going to? And he just, you know, just used to sort of, now in my early twenties, and I cannot remember the reason why, he activated, my him and my mother activated the implants. Mm -hmm. And then I just transformed. I, I really realized that I didn't have long on this earth. Um, I had to get my head down. I had to focus. I had to make an impact. I had to, um, I really had to achieve something. Uh, and, and, and so I took it more or less day by day. I built, I sort of put a brick in place and I'd leave it, put another brick in place. And then I looked up and suddenly I looked up, I'd, I'd got somewhere. But wow, you know, that, but it, it was my parents. You, you, you just imbibe them. You just, you, you don't know it. And uh, uh, so when I was growing up, you know, my team, I used to resist their influence. I mean, they, they, they put us in school in Oxford and we were at secondary school, boarding school there. They were in Nigeria. And uh, they used to, you know, every, every year my father would bring us home without fail, right? So we would fight back, myself and my brother. Ah, no, 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 daddy, we need to go skiing. We need to go mountaineering, all that nonsense. And my dad said, no, you're coming home. You know, even if you sit in the house, too, you're coming home. And I will never, ever, ever forget what he did, you know, insisting on us coming. So it's that, it's that, it's that that makes me tick. It's, it's what I, it's what I took in from my parents 
innocently um, that has now come out like a storm uh, as, I, as I've got older. And I, I, I just know that, that it must have come from there. Wow. I quite like the, the idea of the implants, uh, you know, that our parents put inside us, sorry. <coughs> and and yes. that point, or we activate it. It's, it's a very beautiful image of, uh, you know, of the power of education and, and parents, parents' love. When I think of you, the following words come to my mind. Hardworking, achieving, you told me makes you speak. So how do you define yourself? Um, I define myself as a Pan-African. Pan-African. I, I, I define myself as a Pan-African, somebody with a passion for, for people, um, somebody who loves to build. I love to build. And it's, you know, it, whether I'm building a little mini institution, whether I'm building a little career or trying to, I love creating uh, because you kind of put in and you watch it grow. Um, and it's important to make sure that the structure is sound, whatever you're doing. Uh, and it's a deliberate process, yeah. but a very satisfying one. So I, I, I think I build. I, like, I love building. I love building. And it, it allows you to, to have so many sort of um, interests because to build, you have to bring together so many components. And that may be people, that may be ideas, that may be passions, that may be, you know, negotiations. It, it, it may be objects, ideas. It's, it's, it's a building and then um, trying to make a coherent whole of it, right, which is, is something that needs strategic thought. It needs uh, to be able to communicate. It needs to be able to bring people together, um, to focus on on a mission um, to install passion in people mm -hmm. and the idea that they can do things together. So that whole building thing really appeals to me. And that's what really makes me tick. Um, I don't so much like, I, I sometimes shrink, shy away from the front, but other times you kind of realize that unless you're either in the front seat or in the front passenger seat, right? You, you, can't really steer the vehicle, you know? So you, you have to make a decision. Okay, am I going to be sitting in the back giving instructions or am I going to jump into the front? Um, and although they jumping in the front carries with it risks and it, it brings you, you know, it, it really raises your head above the parapet. You have to make a decision. Um, and, and so the, there are times when I jump in the front, as you can see, I have to jump in the front. Um, and, it, it, and it's also because you often have a very clear idea about what needs to be done. And it's, it's very frustrating when you know that sometimes it's just a question of hard work. It's a question of grind. Forget the glory. You just have to grind something out. Um, and you've got to do that nitty gritty stuff. And sometimes when you're looking at someone, you know, in front, they're doing the nice stuff, but you know that the, underneath the bonnet, the, the engine is a mess. So you, you have to, just do that dirty work. And I, I enjoy doing the dirty work. Um, you know, it's, 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 part of, it's part of the discipline that our parents brought to us, you know. I mean, the days when, you know, I, you know just like you, I, I grew up ironing, I grew up mopping, I grew up cleaning floors, I grew up sweeping the compound, you know, turning over the, the garden. I grew up, I mean, I grew up doing manual work, you know, um, and really doing my chores, and if I didn't do my chores, my mother would send somebody up. I would be running off, you know, to, to avoid her, her admonition, you know, her admonition. And when she admonished me, it was, it was serious. So I'd run off and she'd send the garden, gardener after me and he would be apologizing and catching up with me because, you know, I had, a, he was the one, I would at night, I would try and bribe him by giving him, you know, something at, at dinner and to try and make sure that he didn't catch me, but he had to catch me because my mom <laughs> sent it. 
Um, but my mother was, was, was a disciplinar disciplinarian and uh, she just uh, wouldn't let you get away with anything. You know, <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you, you can identify, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But that's, you know, it's part of the education. Yeah. What, what does it feel like to be a pioneer, Oba? A pioneer, the only and or the youngest black person in your position in the UK countless times. And what will it take for black law professionals to reach top positions, more of them, I mean, in the Western world? I mean, first of all, it's a privilege. Um, it's an honor. I don't take it lightly um, because often, you know, I, I get there and I, I'm thankful for it. Um, other times it makes me a little bit sad um, because, I mean, I'll give you an example. As you said, I, I became a part-time judge at 35, which is over 20 years ago. And every year we have to go for our training sessions and our refresher sessions. And that's usually about 100 judges together for two or three days. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years, just over 20 years. And, I've, and I still am the only black person in there. That, that makes me sad when I look around the room and I'm thinking, how can, I, how can it still be this way? How can it just still be? You know, this is really, this is really embarrassing. It's just still me. You know, and, and, and I think this can't be right, you know. Um, I mean, things are changing a, a little bit. I mean, uh, you know, certainly in London, you, you're seeing a lot more not black professionals, black lawyers, black judges, uh, part-time judges. But in my area, right, when I go training, it's, I still often am the only one. And I find that sad. Um, that makes me very thoughtful about the pace of change and whether people really, you know, want change, you know, at a level which will make a big difference, or whether those changes are just window dressing and just minor concessions just to, you know, allow for uh, peace and quiet, basically. Uh, a meaningful change is very difficult to achieve. It's very difficult to achieve, and, and it's difficult to achieve on our continent, you know, it's, it's difficult to achieve everywhere um, because they're, they're, they're opponents to change. They're people who don't particularly want to change. Um, they, they find it threatening. Uh, they find it, you know, they find it, uh, they find it unnatural. They, 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 they find that it undermines them. So change is difficult. Um, and, and I think I see it everywhere. Change in Nigeria, change is, is difficult to achieve. Um, and it just takes you, it takes a lot of bravery and courage of, of, of women and men to really change things. And they have to be prepared for the fight, you know, and it, literally the fight. And, and different kinds of fights, you know, because of course, here it's a far more subtle fight. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an, often an unseen fight. And you really don't know where, quite where the opposition is. But in Nigeria, they'll, if you stand there, they'll tell you. That, that you're, no, you will not, no, you will not pass. You will not do what you think you're going to do. They'll tell you straight that, you know, we'll, you, you know, they won't hide. So very different types of, of opposition and very different types of challenges and ways of navigation, you know, um, uh, and it's learning that navigation. And, and I think you asked me another question around what does it take? Well, I, I think I would say it's tenacity, you know, you really have to be resilient and tenacious. I mean, it's it's good to be it's good to be academic. It's good to 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 know your stuff. It's good to be expert in what you do. But really, what sets the people apart is resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes because there are a lot of clever people around. But what what really distinguishes those who make it or get further along is the is the a, 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 an almost an iron will. Yes. To, to, to succeed and to, to, to impact, um, to make a difference. And they will not be shaken, you know. They'll have knocks and every now and then they'll be slowed down, but they will not be shaken. They, you're just not going to blow them off path. And, and I, I think I'm one of those people. I, 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 I have an iron will. 
in the end. And, and of course, you know, it's, it, you have to listen, you have to be conciliatory, you, you have to be empathetic, and I, I hope I'm all of those things. But at the end of the day, if I do believe that something needs doing, it's difficult to shake me off that, that path. Um, yeah. And the world needs people like that, definitely. Definitely. Uh, well, I, I think, yeah, I, I hope so. And I think for us to really, you know, to make progress, it does need alliances. We have to form alliances. We, we need to support each other, um, hold each other up, you know, set good examples for ourselves and for our children and show determination. But we, we will make quicker progress when we bond and support each other. And I'm talking about everywhere and particularly in our, in our country, you know, where, where in, in Nigeria and, and where you are as well, where, where we're from, it's it's putting aside those um, petty petty rivalries and greed and seeing the bigger picture because actually there's enough for everybody and yeah. uh, you know, there, there really is more than enough you know um, so it's better to share and live and live with the peace of mind um, than to feel that you need to grab 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 you know and, and it's just well, what are you grabbing it for? And you, you're grabbing so much you can't even you can't even spend what you've grabbed. Uh, you, you can't even you can't even sleep at night, you know. So I, I I really believe that if we just concede more often, we just allow each other a little bit more um, respect, a bit more understanding. You know, don't feel that we have to always be the number one, always be the one that the big man, the big woman, the, the big stick. Uh, you know, it's, 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 I think we just see too much of it. Yeah, I think um, if we let go the the ego and the greed and yeah. have religions is what you're saying. Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah, definitely. So, Abba, you have the best of both worlds as you practice law in the UK as Prince Council, in Nigeria internationally. What main differences or challenges do you come across culturally and professionally? <clears throat> I, yeah, I'm lucky to travel between the two um, worlds of law. Uh, they're very different. I mean, very different. I would say one of the main differences is that in Nigeria, lawyers are not just lawyers. They, they you find that they're up to all, they're doing all sorts of things. Um, they're polymaths. So they, you find them involved in business, involved in politics, involved in, you know, all sorts of other things alongside or instead of law. Mm -hmm. and, and that really complicates things. Uh, because it introduces all sorts of agenda that you really, you know, I don't, can't understand myself. And I find that difficult to, to navigate when I'm, when I'm there because I just can't, I haven't had the grounding, right, in all of these um, multiple ways of, of, of doing stuff. I, I, I'm far more sort of, I have a more sort of narrow focus and a narrow kind of upbringing. So the difference is, so whereas, you know, I'm in the UK, um, you know, a lawyer is a lawyer, you know, you, you, you practice you know, and you, you go to court, you, you, you kind of, that's pretty much what you do. In Nigeria, a lawyer is not just a lawyer. Um, and I suppose it's out of, you know, uh, slightly out of necessity for some people, but other people it is just sheer greed uh, and they've forgotten the, uh, the importance of their vocation, the ethics around their vocation, and the fact that actually um, you dilute your standing when you allow yourself to be drawn into all sorts of things other than law and you expose yourself to serious risk, reputational risk. Um, so th that's a lot of difference. And of course, practice is uh, going to court. It's a lot slower because a lot of the time our, our judges are still writing in longhand. So you say something, they write, you know, and it just the whole thing is so slow. And uh, you, you start a case, you maybe do one witness, and then you adjourn. And you think you, you adjourn for like six months, you know? Whereas in the UK, you start a case, you finish a case. 
you, yeah. you start, so you have to, like, if I start a case tomorrow, the judge will sit the day after day after until, until he or she is finished. And sometimes yeah. it'll be two or three days. Whereas, you know, in Nigeria, you do an hour or two, maybe even half an hour, and then the judge adjourns. And, and they have, like, a very, very long docket list. So they've got loads of cases piled up in front of them. You can barely see past the registrar. And, uh, you know, I wonder sometimes how these files don't just get mislaid, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's very different. It's very different. Um, it's very different. I, 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 uh, in a funny way, it's even, in Nigeria, it's even more formal. Yeah. It's like, and, and you know, we're still wearing wigs in this hot, hot sun, you know. So if the fan is not working in court or the, the air condition is not working, you're just sweating with your, this, this um, horsehair wig on your head <laughs> and a gown, which is definitely not what you should be wearing in, in West Africa. Um, of course, in the UK, it keeps you warm. Um, but it, I, I just think, yeah, I think we've adopted a number of things that actually, if we sit down and think about it, they don't really make sense. No. Um, but we won't. No. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, may I share with you an example that impacted the course of your career or that are related to your activities? No, for sure. I mean, I, I think, as I was telling you about my early life, right, so when I was at school, I was in a boarding school in Oxford, and... Um, I, you know, I felt I should really be earning mm -hmm. because I had activities to fund. So I, even, even though we were not allowed to, I got myself a part-time job. Um, and what I used to do is I used to sell cleaning agents, right? So like fairy liquid and cloths and mops and all that kind of stuff. I was called a clean easy agent, okay? So, and I would go knocking on doors you know, to sell, and I would have my salesman's pitch, you know, this is this, this is this new product and all this kind of stuff, and I would just go into this pitch, would you like that, that, that I'm your new clean, easy agent, that, et cetera. So I was doing that in my, generally around my school, and I knocked on one door, and I, and I kind of looked down in my bucket, so I have a bucket full of, you know, all sorts of things, looked down in my bucket, looked up again, and I'm your new clean, easy agent, and it was my housemaster. <laughs> I knocked on, I knocked on his door, and 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 he actually, right? He actually, he, firstly, he was shocked, and then he said, he said "Oh, you know," he, and I he just, then he burst out laughing because <laughs> because I was all dressed up in my thing, um, and I went into his his room the next day, and he he basically said, "Look, you know, I'm not going to even warn you. I know you were just you know trying to get, but that left an impression on me around." Uh, you know, you can, you do have, you can have choices when you're dealing with a young person. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can choose what you do or say to them. Uh, you can, at times, you can be strict with them. Other, other times, you can just encourage them. Yeah. And I, and I never forget, he just, he just kind of encouraged me. He said, well, I, you know, I don't think you should make a habit of it, but I understand what you're doing and I understand why you're doing it. So that really left an Im impact on me. The other Thing that really influenced me, I think, was my father because I used to I used to spend a lot of time avoiding him because I didn't have much to say. I didn't, I, I, I had nothing sensible to say. So I he would be sitting in the in the in the palo as we call it the palo, you know, um, in his wrapper, and he would look like he was asleep, but he was not asleep. So I would sneak past him, trying to get outside, you know, and I would kind of side along the side wall and and get outside, and he I he looked like he had ice cream. Then one time, you know, I was sneaking by. I said, oh, well. and I said, come and sit down. So I said, I said, okay, daddy. I went and sat down. And I was, I was, I was 17. And um, he said, look, it's time you, what are you going to do in your life? What, what are you going to do? It's time you thought about what you're going to do. And you tell me, you sit here, tell me, you know, you, you tell me what you're going to do. So I said, dad, dad, I think I'm going to be a football player, right? I'm going to be a football player. So he just went quiet for a bit. And at that time, you know, I was not particularly good. I, 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 could, I was in the team, but I was not particularly good. And he said, um, oh, okay, football. So when you get injured, what are you, you going to do? And I said, well, you know, I, I get over the injury, etc. So when you get to 30, what are you going to do? I said, well, Danny, there's always coaching. So he went silent for a while. 
And then he said, no, you do law. <laughs> so that was like from nowhere. No, 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 but you do law, you know. And I, you know, spent about 30 seconds resisting. But when your dad tells you, you do law, you do law, you know. So, <laughs> so I, I, I got up and said, okay. Uh, I, I said, but why, why law? Why, why law? And, and he said, well, I read a school report of yours when you were 13. 13, can you imagine that? Yet? Thinking back, 13. And, and, the, and the school teacher said, you're going to be a good lawyer. You, you, you need to do law. And I, you know, so I went away thinking this is crazy law, you know. But he, my dad was spot on. He was, you know, because that, when I started doing law, I realized that this is really what I should be doing. And he was absolutely right. Um, but, he, but your parents know you a lot better than, you, than you're prepared to admit, right? <laughs> so, so, yeah, he was, he was spot on. Those two things I, I'll never forget. Um, um, and the other one that happened was when I was, um, I guess I was in my early 30s. And I was practicing just here in the UK. I was just got my head down. And a letter came for me from the senior presiding judge of England and Wales, who eventually became the Lord Chief Justice. Um, Lord, Lord, Lord Chief Justice Judge, right? So, so he, you know, appropriately named. And the letter said, "Look, I'd like to see you um, tomorrow morning in my in my judges' chambers in in Strand, in the Royal Courts of Justice." So I thought I was in trouble. Um, so I went in. I went in the next day, of course. And he sat me down and he said, "Look, I'd like you to think about an assignment." And I said, "Okay, what what's that?" He said, "I want you to train judges." I was, I was young. I wanted to train judges on issues around uh, racism and issues around ethnicity and, and understanding different cultures. Uh, because what's happening in these courts are the judges are sentencing a lot of black people without any real understanding of their backgrounds, of their hardships, of their challenges. And they're just to them, it's, and I want you to train. And I knew what he was really saying. He was basically saying to me, I want you to tell a few judges that they're racist. And I was young. And I was thinking, okay, this is, this is a poison chalice. This, is not, this, is, this, this ain't good. Uh, so he said, uh, I said, well, uh, he, uh, he said, okay, you go ahead and think about it. Come back tomorrow morning and let me know what you decided. So I came back and I, I of course, I, I, I said yes. And that was when I got into the Judicial Studies Board from there to the Judicial College and then a broader train. So I started off training on, on ethnic minority issues. Um, and so then I went on to train on, on a much broader scale. But that, to me, taught, taught me that sometimes a challenge is presented to you and it does look very daunting and you're wondering, you know, uh, this is one you need to pass. But there's certain challenges that you just have to take and rise to the occasion. And um, that was one where really that could have been the end of me, really, because I remember my first tutorial with a crusty old bunch of judges in their 50s, 60s, 70s, just looking at me. This was this chap come to, what was he come to tell us, you know, and just waiting for me to mess this thing up um, and, and, and to kind of talk about the issues in a way that they could say that I prejudged them and I, you know, what I was saying was right. So I had to really think about what I was saying and how I was going to approach these topics. And I went through basically case studies and that kind of thing, you know, um, and, and kind of challenging them in a way that really I think took them by surprise and started to point out that these things, sometimes they're deliberate, I'm afraid, but other times they're just um, inadvertent, a lack of understanding uh, and, and an inability to read people and a lack of empathy, not knowing what lies behind it. But, so I took them through case studies and, and, and then other, other ways of really imparting learning, you know, about us. Um, and that, in the end, worked because I was exposed to a lot of judges in the UK. And if I had messed it up, I'm sorry, they would have just, I would have just sent packing. And that was when I, was, I got to 35. And I was, I was basically invited by the, um, I think at that stage it was the junior presiding judge. said, look, I think you need to apply to, to sit as a judge. And I, I said, well, I, I think I'm a bit young. He said, no, 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 you, you need to apply. So that was, that was how that happened. And I applied and went through the interview process and the reference process. And so 
So yeah, but take a challenge, you know, accept a risk. Um, but once you accept it, just make sure you deliver. You know, it's uh, it's a blessing. Take a challenge, accept the risk, and make sure you deliver. Wise words indeed, wise words. What makes you an international public speaker? And where do you get the confidence to stand there and speak? What makes people listen to you? Uh, it's important when you speak to be able to read your audience, number one. Number two, never speak for too long because people just don't, in the end, they'll switch off. Number three, speak with humor, right? Employ humor in what you say because humor has a way of breaking down barriers. Uh, and and, and, and number, number five, I'd say, or number four, I'd say, don't take yourself too seriously, you know? There are times when it's effective to depreciate yourself as a speaker. Um, ensure that you speak in a, in a way that is persuasive and use your voice. Yes. Use your voice. It's a very powerful thing. And you kind of listen to yourself speak. So you can use your voice in a way that goes up and down and slows down and speeds up. And so you can use your voice in a, it, as really a tool. Yeah. That, that holds attention. So just check, your, check the pace at which you speak. You know, sometimes pause. When I'm, when I'm in front of a judge, some judges, right, who are basically against the points I'm making, you can tell they've made their minds up. And they are really against your submission or against the point you're making or the legal issue you're trying to explain or indeed the argument you're putting on behalf of a the client. They, they've switched off. And uh, they're... There are, there are times when I'll be making a submission, then I'll stop. And I'll stop for around three, four seconds. Mm -hmm. And the judge, the judge will, <laughs> will look up and wonder why I've stopped. And I've only stopped really to add to the persuasion, right? So I have stopped to get their attention because I know that the he or she is switching off. So there are many techniques you can use um, to, to speak. And as to where do I get the confidence, I don't, I'm not sure I'm, 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 I'll ever really feel completely confident about speaking. But once you get on your feet, you've you got to say something. Yeah. You've got to say something. <laughs> you know, it's too late. You know, once you're up, it's too late. You have to, you have to find the words. And, and so I think it's then you read, you look around, you read people, you, you, you think about what you're saying. You know, say it, say it in a way that has layers to it. Um, in a meaningful way. So speaking does take practice. There are some people who are just naturally gifted, and, you know, I envy them, but it does take practice, years of practice. Um, I mean, after, like, around 10, 12 years as an advocate, I then started training other advocates, and I realized that it does, it is a technique. Mm -hmm. You know, there are ways of teaching people to, 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 to advocate, to persuade, right, to argue, there are, it's, 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 it can be taught, you know, <laughs> it can be taught. Definitely. No, I, I, can't, I couldn't agree more. You know, the power of silence, the use of tonality. Yeah, yeah. there are techniques, of course. Thank you. Oba, with a subject that's very close to my heart, you have recently been appointed as the new chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Africa Center in London. Can you please tell us more about your vision for the center going forward? Uh, Nadia, as one of our ambassadors and as one of our dearest former trustees, this is close to both of our hearts. Because when you were at the Africa Center as a trustee and as you are now as an ambassador, you live and breathe Africa. And for you, the Africa Center was simply another vehicle to express yourself. And for me, the Africa Center is an important vehicle to express myself. And I remember the days when you would go to, the Africa Center was in a temporary home at that stage in Rich Mix. Um, we had, a, we had a, basically a, a, new, <laughs> a new director who had no clue apart from numbers, very good at numbers, 
you know, rigorous, but he was an accountant, right? So all the creative layers, I'm sorry to say, were not present. And you and Big Bear would go and add all those layers to him and add all the support, you know, free, just voluntary. And it's a passion. It is. It's a passion. So, so say, hey, listen, Nadia, you, you, it's not something you lose. It's, it's another vehicle for expressing our love for our continent. And so the Africa Center now, I have this honor of being its chair, following on from Oliver Andrews, who you've had on as a guest. Um, Oliver is so inspirational. And it is, it is so important, right? So our mission for the Africa Center is we have defined our mission as we exist, to educate, to connect, and to advocate for Africa and its diaspora. Mm -hmm. To educate, to connect to, and to advocate for Africa and its diaspora. That's what we exist to do. And we do that in many ways. Um, so of course, uh, there's the idea of uh, the Young Africa Center, which is its future, never been, never been more important. And when you look at the Africa Center uh, with its history of 60 years, it's probably, you know, obviously with charities, they go through peaks and troughs as we all do in institutions. So it's had its peaks, it's had its troughs, it's had its difficult times, it's had its challenging times. But in, in some of its best times, you had um, uh, Desmond Tutu, mm -hmm. you, you, you had uh, Grace, you know, dear old Grace, you had um, uh, Oliver Temple, you know, all of, all of these people were passing through Nelson Mandela's freedom speech, read from the Africa Center, um, amazing artists, Malangatana, you know, um, even Chimamanda Adichie doing, doing, doing some reading in the Africa Center, um, just incredible, incredible history. And our archives are so rich. So now our mission now is to make sure that we have a modern outlook for the Africa Center that changes the narrative, it challenges the narrative around Africa and how people see Africa. So we want to portray a bold, confident continent. And that is a vision which all of us buy into. And a confident continent that has so much to offer outside what people think Africa has to offer, where you have all these images as Africa essentially being one country which we know is not. So different, even countries in West Africa, so different, languages, cultures, food, you know? And not to even talk about North Africa. So we want to highlight our strengths through our differences. We want to really shine a light on some of the innovation. Um, you know, in Africa, we'll take something that you would otherwise throw away here, and create something beautiful. Yes. You know, create something beautiful. I remember in, in Zambia when we were growing up, you know, we used to have all these coat hangers, these wire coat hangers, right? And we used to make out of those, these wire cars, really amazing cars, which we'd steer. Yes. <laughs> Made out of coat hangers. And, and, and so Africa has so much to offer that we have to, as a platform in the Africa Center, being the hub it is, I mean, being the hub it is, we um, have to be that connector, that platform, that hub for innovation, for storytelling, for our histories. Uh, we need to rewrite the idea, all those missing gaps in education around Africans and its diaspora, all those missing gaps about the contributions made by black people and African people in the wars, for example. If you read the history books, you wouldn't believe that some Africans fought in the war. Thousands of them fought in the war and lost their lives. You know, it's nothing in the history books. If you, read, if you read some of the great books about art, you will struggle to see an African artist. You know, you might, you might stumble across Basquiat, you know, because Basquiat brilliant artist that he was, he was at something of a novelty, you know, they, they liked his, his tragic story, uh, he killed himself very young. So Basquiat was, you know, the very few artists that were trumpeted. But now, as you know, we are now absolutely filling those history books yes. with our, our pride and our beauty 
and a lot of it is expressed through art, right? So at the Africa Center, we're, we're just forming something called ACT, ACT, a platform called ACT, Art from Africa at the Africa Center. Um, and that's going to be a, a cross-fertilization between curators, between artists, between collectors, and just a generally curious and interactive platform where we will store knowledge. About four weeks ago, as you know, we had an Africa Design Day for our interiors in our new building. So we basically put a call out for artisans and for designers from the continent, from, our, from the African continent, to come and imagine the Africa Center's interior with us and showcase there. And so we had the design day and we had uh, over 50 participants from the continent, you know, on Zoom. So you had people in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in, 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 in Ivory Coast, you know, in, in Cameroon, um, Nigeria, of course, just on Zoom, showcasing their designs. And then we had submissions from them because they're going to help us do the interiors. So the Africa Center is going to be a very, very important institution. It's going to be the bridge, Nadia, the bridge between, right, a modern, confident, bold Africa and Europe. And we will cross that bridge as little minnows, but we're little vessels. And in our, in, our, in, our, in our hearts, we carry Africa. And we will cross the bridge with Africa in our hearts. And we will then, when we get to the other side, we will talk passionately about Africa in a way that nobody will be able to diminish. And that's the bridge that the Africa Center is going to be again. And it's been, in, it's been that in the past, and it will be that again in the future. Um, and so, I mean, you know, you know the time and effort and the passion that's required to build, to build, okay? And it means selfless building, you know? Forget all the egos, you just have to come and work. If you're not ready to work, then a step away, because there are lots of people who are ready to work. And make sure that young people are at the heart of what you do, because they want to know, they want to learn, they want to know about their histories. Um, and as soon as you open the doors for them, just watch them fly. Mm -hmm. Just watch them fly. Fly past you, you know, create. And, and so that is why you, I, and others, I'm sure, on this call are passionate about, about our content. There's a lot wrong. We can't deny it. There's a lot wrong. But funnily enough, in a funny way, when there's a lot wrong, the passion is greater because there's, yeah. more, to, there's more to fix. You know, there's more to fix. If we lived these gray lives where everything was fine, what would we be, what would we be passionate about? So it, there's a lot to fix. We know that there's a lot to fix. It's going to take while, a time to fix it. But the satisfaction you get from fixing it is, 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 is really amazing. Well, I couldn't agree more of, uh, you know, that passion is oozing out of you. And uh, yeah, of course. It, it is. I love it. Um, I, I don't ever regret the Africa Center. And, and you know, it, it's, it's another vessel. There are lots of other vessels around. Um, but I think it's important to find one. Find a vessel. Find something you're passionate about. If you don't find something you're passionate about in life, right, then you're going to find you've somehow allowed it to pass you by. And sad to say, we're not here for that long. That is the truth. Um, so whilst we're here, find a passion and live it. You know, live it. Uh, make sure you really get underneath what makes you happy. You know? And um, so I, I, I don't... And of course, you know, you being a lover of art, right? Yeah. You, know, you know, a lover of art, and it allows us to, to live our dreams. You know, um, we, we, we love our artists and they bring a beauty, they bring an, an, a, a kind of timeless beauty to our lives that, uh, you know, they're, they're saying something. The best art is yeah. that the art that is speaking. Okay, there's no real point in painting something that doesn't speak. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So exactly. that... that it opens our, our minds up. It makes us travel and live a million lives. It does. It does. Um, and whatever language it is it's speaking in, it has to speak to you, you know. 
Um, and that's the, that is the best art. So what, one of my big passions, as you know, is, is, is art. I mean, not just African art, although that is, is my main love, but I, I just love, I just love art. Uh, I guess probably my favorite is, is abstract expressionism, funnily enough. Um, so when I take myself away from African art, I, I, I do love Rothko. I love Robert Motherwell. You know, I love artists like Franz Klein, William de Kooning, you know, uh, Joan Mitchell. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and, and that takes me to a different, a different world, Basquiat. I love Basquiat. Uh, but then closer to home, you know, where, where you're looking at some of our artists, Abudia, you know, you've got to really look carefully at the way he paints these street children. Um, you know, I love, I love Abudia. Yusuf Grillo, which is a, who's a Nigerian artist, paints with dignity, paints women with dignity. He kind of um, gives them a grace and a color that is just amazing. Um, and just other artists, you know, there's, a, there's a, an, an artist I love called Neil Maloga. Neil Maloga, he, he, he kind of cuts things up and sticks them in places where you wouldn't expect. So the overall picture looks broken and a bit disfigured. But there's a beauty in what he does. And he does ordinary South African daily black people. And when you look at that disfigurement, it's all about their struggles. What he's saying is it's, it's their struggles but put together in a way that is perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Turn the pain into beauty. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, about by getting to the end of this talk, what advice would you like to give members of our audience who would like to embark on a career path similar to yours? Well, I would... I'd, I'd, always, I'd, always, I'd always hold law up, right? Um, because it allows you to, I mean, you, you, you have to be ready to work. I, 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 I won't lie, law is, is a, it's a serious vocation and you, there are a lot of long nights. Um, because, you, you know, there are deadlines, there are people relying on you. Uh, by the time you get to court, you need to be pretty much ready, you know, no matter how much lack of sleep you've had. Um, so law is tough, but what it does is it actually brings together a number of different skills. So, of course, intellectually, you, you, you've got to have a reasonable grasp of the arguments that you're making, but it also tests your analytical skills. So you've got to be able to analyze and get to the heart of an issue, right? So just, you need to cut through and and have the confidence to decide, yes, this one issue is going to win the case. And leave aside all the other issues, right? And that, that, takes, that, takes, that takes a bit of a risk. Because the client will be telling you, oh, no, no, this is important. No, this is the one thing that's going to win the case. And you need to win at that point. Um, and, and it also brings in the ability to persuade. And, and, and it allows you into people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's sad to say, right, when lawyers get involved, it's usually when things have gone badly wrong, whether it's in a business or whether it's in a, in a marriage or whether it's, it, it's, it's with children um, or whether somebody's sick. Or it's, it's, it's so we're lucky because people trust us with their problems. Um, and often when they're at their lowest end, you know, you see them and you have to act for them. Corporate bust-ups, even corporate bust-ups, which I always describe as a little bit soulless, right? Because it's often just money, um, and that's really what it is. But even corporate bust-ups, when you get to meet the board or the, 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 the people that have built the company or that you understand the grievance, even those um, have, a, have, a, have a particular life of themselves. So I would always hold up more. And I, you know, if I was asked to sort of give advice to, to the sorts of things that you're doing, um, you're, you're basically bringing people together and you're holding conversations. And you, you just never know what comes from a conversation, right? Um, and that's important that we talk. It's important that we learn from each other. 
Um, so law allows you to do that and, and organizations like yours and what you're doing by bringing together these sorts of conversations, it allows us to share time talking and, and to learn from each other. So you might just pick up something which you can take forward and do something else with. And that's the beauty of conversation. Wow, well, thank you, Oba. Any final thoughts? as we close this conversation? I, 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 just, I, just, I just think that whilst we're here, we're under a duty to do good. We, we have no real choice, okay? So there are other ways of doing things and the things you, you'd be tempted to take a shortcut. Um, you know, you think our life is too hard, it's tough, but whilst we're here, we um, have got to find a way. In, you know, it might just be one step, but take that step or make that step for somebody else. And then somebody else can then carry on that next step and we move forward. Then somebody might knock us back a step, but then we, go, we, go, we pick up and we go again. Wow. And, and, and that's how we'll build. I love that we are on a duty to do good. And I adhere, totally adhere to it. I know you do. So, so much. I know your time is extremely precious. And thank you for generously giving us your time today. Very happy, Nadia. Very happy. Very happy too. Our audience is very happy. Everyone's putting, you know, thank yous and very insightful listening to you. Thanks, Oba. So thank you a million times. Dear friends, before we part, I'd like to announce our next week guests. And as we were speaking about art, we will just continue with the arts as our next guest is the founder of 154, Turia El Glawi. So please, next Thursday, same time, same place, make sure you join us. Sheila Cogni will be interviewing Turia Ed Glawi, who is a common friend of ours, Oba. She is. And I look forward to it, Nadia. I just want to thank everybody that's tuned in, taking time to tune in. Um, love to meet you all in person one day, uh, but just keep doing what you're doing, and uh, we will come together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oba. Take good care pleasure. of you. My pleasure. Bye-bye, Nadia. Stay stay best and see you next week same place same time for yet another awesome speaker bye -bye. we'll do i'll be there i'll be there nadia take care thank you bye bye, bye everyone